we're with Lawrence Lessig, and we were talking about street fighting. Now, Lawrence, when you throw an elbow, oh, no, that was a different <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Never mind. We had been talking about the whole gamut of things. We had lunch. Lawrence came to my stand-up. He was like, you're the greatest of all time. He fell at my feet. Um, that's not important, and that's not what's relevant to this conversation. Larry Lessig, as I know him, but he's Lawrence Lessig, author of Republic Lost. Um, you were, we were, I wanted to take this podcast, and I wanted to go through, I wanted to, in, in the beginning of the book, you have a Thoreau quote, I see men everywhere hacking at the branches of evil while none are striking the root. That's a paraphrase, but let's get to the root. Let's do it quickly. Let's break it down. Let's make it user friendly because the minute we say campaign finance no, reform, no, 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 right? The minute I say campaign, we fall asleep. Like, right? <laughs> and, 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 and last time we spoke, you said, look, the bottom line is your government doesn't represent you. Right. And we, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the electoral college. I want to talk about how Congress has taken it and made it so that it's a, it's a zero-sum game. Um, I want to talk about district redistricting, how fundraisers, how really 100,000 people are all that matter when it comes to political elections and uh, how we have lost our republic in many ways. And then we're going to get into probably the idea that maybe we're getting to a point where we don't need our, we don't need government, or maybe government is behaving in such a way that it's becoming irrelevant. That's that a lot. Be, that's we're going to cover a lot. <laughs> we're going to cover a lot. It's kind of amazing that way. That's what I that's, saw last night. <laughs> you see that? Lawrence has called me amazing. He never uses that word. <laughs> never. The last time he used that word was when that, that guy, Donald Trump, was elected to office. <laughs> and he goes, amazing. This guy really is going to drain the swamp. Um, but to an extent, it's about draining the swamp. To an extent, you know, we, we are... Explain to me what the problem is. I mean, well, let, let me put it this way. If you had been in the Democratic debates, no matter what they said, whether it was health care, whether it was, you know, whatever it might have been, you would have said to the other candidates, you can't do any of this stuff. Not while our government has the incentive structure it has. Not while the kind of, not, not when, as a congressman, you're going to spend 30 to 70% of your time raising money and kissing ass. Right? Yeah, that's right. So... What's astonishing to watch when you see those politicians up on stage is that they pretend that they're talking about ideas that they can actually do something about. So they want to talk about health care, or they want to talk about uh, dealing with inequality, or they want to talk about how we're going to have jobs back in the United States. Um, and they talk about it as if, if they get elected, they can actually make something happen. But what I wanted to say, if I've been on that debate stage, is that there are a lot of great ideas about what we should do with health care or jobs or immigration. But every one of those issues, they know they can't make any progress so long as we fund campaigns by turning to the richest 100,000 Americans and asking them to fund campaigns. So they know that, and they should be fixing that, but they just don't want to address it. So explain and so break down what the average congressman is faced with. The average congressman, what is the average congressman, what is the reality of what they have to do day in and day out. Yeah, but I get elected, or if I want to get elected. The day you're elected, yeah. from that moment on, you realize that what you're going to do is spend 30 to 70% of your time on the phone. Like, when I started taking up this issue, uh, my congressman had just died, and Joe Trippi, who ran Howard Deeds' campaign, flew out, and he said, uh, I want you to run for Congress, and I'll run your campaign. And he said, uh, this is the one promise you got to make. Every day, you're going to spend two to four hours on the phone calling people to raise money. And I said, no, Howard, I can send them emails. He said, no, 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 <laughs> you've got to call them. You've got to call them for two to four hours every day. And I said, this makes this decision really easy because there's no way I could do that. And then I thought, who are those people who can do that? What kind of person are we filtering for in building our government? The kind of person who can suck up to rich people for half their day, every single day, seven days a week. It's amazing. And what it does is it produced this pathetically incapable Congress, can't do anything 
because they know if they do anything that's going to upset their funders, then they're not going to get funded. And this tax bill that was just passed, $1.6 trillion tax bill, there was a congressman from New York who, who, who on the floor of the House said, you know, I, I spoke to my donors and they told me if I don't get this, this bill passed, I should never call them again. So it's as transparent as it could be. They were not going to support him again if he didn't give a huge tax cut to them. And that's the way government. So when you are a congressman, you are given a list of very wealthy people that you call and they're kind of all that matter. Yeah, I mean, it's really extraordinary. They all race off of Capitol Hill because the law says they're not allowed to fundraise from Capitol Hill. So there are these telemarketing offices right off of Capitol Hill. And it, like any telemarketing office, these little cubbies, and they sit there and their assistant has the names and they have headphones. Or they do it in their car. Or in their car, right. But uh, you got to be efficient about it, right? So they have these machines and they dial and they are told exactly what they need to say to this person, you know, real estate or you're in chemicals or you're in coal mining, whatever. And you say what you need to say to get the money you need from that person. And you don't, it's not corrupt in the old sense. You're not like saying, if you give me $10,000, I'll give you a vote. It's, it's more subtle than that. Like you begin to learn what you need to say. You begin to shape shift in the form you need to take to make that person want to listen to you. Yeah, I always liken it to probably something like when you're around a bunch of uh, welders and you, you get a sense that they, they lean a certain way. You're not, gonna, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna really speak your political mind or your religious mind. It's just gonna create tension for no reason. So you're kind of, you know, you're gonna, you're, you're, we're social animals. We yeah, take and those through. people in particular, yeah. they are shapeshifters. That's yeah. their profession. And that means they can't lead and you know, the rich people in America or the people, you know, the running uh, corporations that depend on the favors they get from government, they like it like that because they know if government can't do anything except pass task, tax cuts, then they get to do whatever the hell they want and they get to, you know, pollute the environment or... So what happens when you get a principled politician who's not that? When you get a congressman who's like, you know what, I'm going to stick to my principles. I'm not voting any way other than the way my conscience tells me to. There are some like that. Yeah. I don't think they last very long. Yeah. They change or they go someplace else. And, and you know, why wouldn't you? Yeah. The institutions well, aren't doing anything. That someplace else, if you read so damn much money and you read Republic yeah. Lost, is that they go to K Street and they become lobbyists and make probably five times as much money ten sometimes, times. ten times as much money. Yeah. So there's a there's so so in some ways Congress is the farm team, for farm the, league for K Street. That's Jim Cooper from the Tennessee. farm the farm league for K Street. Right, and they, that's that's what we're living in. Yeah, they have this business model. They go to Washington, you know, they get paid when they first become a congressman about as much as my students get paid when they first become a lawyer. Uh, so they work their way up, and then they graduate and they become partners. But partners means they go to work for K Street. So their whole scheme is like, how do I move into the lobbying business? Because that's where the money is. I don't even have to get a law degree. Because they know everybody in, that, in the Capitol at that point. They know all the people you're supposed to know. Senators do the same thing, don't they? When they lose, when they lose their bid, they go over to K Street and make more money. Yeah. And, and so if you build a government like that, is it any surprise that the government doesn't give the average American what the average American wants? Is it any surprise that they don't represent us? Mm -hmm. now, now, you know, the point I've been trying to make is, you know, when people want to use the word campaign finance and it feels like <clears throat> fingernails on a, on a, on a board, blackboard, yeah. uh, I want to say, look, that's one problem. And, you know, that's a really important part of the problem. But it's just one way in which they don't represent us. We've built a representative democracy that does not in any sense represent us. And if we don't address that, if we don't make them dependent on us, representing us, we're going to continue to be as skeptical and cynical and turned off by the Well, idea. you did some polls, some national polls. Yeah. And I think 91% of the people polled didn't think that they... You're ruining the punchline. Sorry. Yeah. Tell me. <laughs> Sorry, Lawrence. Sorry, there is. Ninety-six percent of Americans yeah. think it important to reduce the influence of money in politics, but ninety-one percent didn't think it was possible. God. So that's like the, that's the politics of resignation. Like yeah. you know, we all wish we could fly like Superman, but we don't jump off of tall buildings because we know we just can't. Yeah. So this this idea, this way of thinking, leads people to just accept this 
corrupt system and say this is just the way the government is and there's nothing we can do about it. And if that's what we accept, we're going to become South Africa. We're going to become a country that can't... Well, that's what we were talking or about. Russia. It, it, it may, it Russia. May, or Russia, it's, or it may become like the idea is that the most Americans say government's no longer relevant. Technology is making it so I can get the things I need yeah. consumption-wise. But that's uh, a fantasy. That's the whole point is, is that if you don't feel like you can change it, then you convince yourself that it doesn't matter. But the reality is that it does matter. Mm. And it matters in South Africa that you have dysfunctional institutions. It matters in Russia that you have dysfunctional institutions. And you end up, one of the things that goes away for people who are libertarian or conservative minded is the free market. Because what ends up happening is you get crony capitalism, which is not capitalism. Yeah. Well, we, you can't do business as a big corporation unless you have a presence in Washington. Absolutely. I mean, these Very banks nice. that talk about um, being the marketplace and Republican, totally sure. you, guys are, you guys are privatizing your gains and socializing your losses. You get a bailout, man. So to me, you don't work in the real market. And, and, and so much already of our our entire, our agriculture, a lot of our healthcare is already a socialized system. Yeah, and it's socialized by the congressmen who know what they have to do to keep the funders and lobbyists happy. So this is an economy of influence where they build the system to make it possible to raise the money they need to stay in government. Um, and they won't change until we demand that this system change. So, you know, I think that's the challenge. How do you get people who right now realize it doesn't make sense to waste their time on this problem because they don't think it can be changed. How do you get them to demand the kind of change that will make it possible to have a government that represents us? They realize they can't avoid the problem, right? And I mean, I think that is that idea of if you're not at the, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And the reality is that most of America is on the menu. And I think the word you use, telemarketer, like we all know what telemarketers are. And that's what our congressmen and our senators are. And they're selling influence. They're like, I would like to sell you a great product. It's amazing. You'll be able to extract money from people and redirect it towards you. Because the tax system, rather than being used for public services, is being used to line the people, uh, the pockets of the people who pay the telemarketers. And so that's what they're peddling. They're peddling the ability to basically steal money from your pocket and put it in their pocket. Explain to us gerrymandering. And, and why, first of all, how Congress draws these districts and what that means to people. Because a lot of people don't, I think those people are actually still a little confused yeah. as to why, for example, in Massachusetts, a million Republicans may, may as well not vote. Why right. is that? Right. Explain that. So state by state, the states draw districts. Um, and they draw districts mainly to protect incumbents. So this, you know, we, we think that we pick our representatives. Our representatives pick us. Mm -hmm. They draw districts so that we will vote in the way they know we will vote and elect them. So they in each state has, has um, let's say, depending, Massachusetts may have six districts. And that means that they have six congressmen representing yeah. Massachusetts. Yeah. And, so, and so they draw districts mm -hmm. so that 90% of Congress, literally, not an exaggerated 90, 90%, is a safe seat, meaning if you're a Republican in a safe seat Democratic district or a Democrat in a safe seat Republican district, you know your congressman doesn't give a shit about you because you could never matter to that congressman. So in Massachusetts, exactly right, a million people voted Republican. We don't have a single Republican congressman from Massachusetts. A million people voted for Donald Trump. There was not a single elector that went for Donald Trump because we structure the system so that we, the politicians get to control exactly what that um, uh, result looks like. Now, what that means is, for those people who are a Democrat in a Republican district or a Republican in a Democrat district, you might as well not vote. 89 million Americans have no reason to vote for Congress because they know that their vote could never change their congressman's uh, And vote. this goes for the Electoral College as well, right? Yeah. Because th somehow states or Congress made it, it's not in the Constitution, made it so that the Electoral College, so if you, if you win, if you get just one more electoral vote than the other side, all those electoral votes go to you. Yeah, state by state, all okay. but two states, have made it so that the Electoral College is winner take all. So the Constitution creates the Electoral College, but it tells the states you can allocate your electors how you want. So they've made it winner take all. So you get one more vote than the other side, you get all the electors. 
And what that means is the only states that matter in the presidential election are battleground states. All the other states are already determined. Because we already know that yeah. the other states like Idaho so, are going right. red, no so matter literally what. In. The fix is in for all the other ones. But so, yeah, in, these, in these 14 states. 14 states out of 15. In 2016, 99% of campaign spending was in those 14 states. The only other spending was when they went to California. 99% of all yeah. spending went ju- to those 14, 14 states. swing states. Yeah. That's so, unbelievable. So that means if you don't live in one of those 14 states, you don't matter to the presidential candidates. And what we can show is that those <clears throat> battleground states get more money per capita than non-battleground states. They get regulations bent to make them happy. When Donald Trump said he was going to end the offshore drilling restriction, within 24 hours, Florida had gotten a waiver. California couldn't even get a hearing because, of course, nobody gives a shit what California thinks. They're not a swing state. But Florida is one of the most important states in the presidential election. So this is a completely artificial structure because of the way states have decided to allocate electoral votes, which means that the election is decided by 14 states that are older, they're whiter, their industry is from the 19th century. There are five times as many people in America who work in solar energy as, as mine coal. But you never hear about solar energy in a presidential election because they don't live in battleground states. What you hear is about coal miners because coal miners live in battleground states. God, that's incredible, man. Mm-hmm. That is, and, and how many, so 14 states matter. How many seats in Congress matter? 45 swing sti- seats. 45 swing yeah. seats yeah. out of uh, the 435? Right. Out of 435, 35 actually matter. Yeah, they matter. And so they're going to spend an extraordinary amount of money to win those swing states. So if you want to be in Congress and you live in Massachusetts, if you're a Republican, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen happen no matter what. But then this is the even worse part. You know, everybody talks about how polarized American politics is. But this is part of the reason. Because if you are a Democrat in Massachusetts and you decide you want to be a congressman, what you know is the only way to beat the incumbent is to be an even more liberal Democrat than the incumbent, Mm. because it's the liberal base that's the active base that will vote in the primary and get you to beat that incumbent. So it favors the lunatic fringe of both sides or the extreme side. Exactly right. Same thing with Republicans. So what you have is this dynamic that incentivizes the extremists to take over and they become the members. So when you have something like gun control and we know all of us agree we don't want a spree shooter. But this kid, meanwhile, the guy's still shooting while nothing, like Congress does nothing. Does do nothing. Is, and, and that's why, because the NRA is so active yeah. in, you, you're not getting, you're not doing anything in a Republican state yeah. unless. Now, the NRA is a hybrid yeah. organization. Yeah. I mean, they have a lot of citizens who believe in uh, gun rights, yeah. and those citizens vote. You know, so we shouldn't diminish. No, I don't diminish the NRA. I'm but the other thing, no, 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 but the other part of the NRA is the money that comes from the gun manufacturers. And that's the money that matters in the NRA. So, so it's, you should criticize the NRA, but we should recognize there are a lot of decent people who have views about guns and they're citizens like we are. And, they, they de- and so, and so they, they deserve to vote, but the system that allows the money to terrify, even you know, Bernie Sanders, couldn't stand up to the NRA in, in, uh, in Vermont. Mm. Um, and so, uh, you know, and his excuse was, well, I come from Vermont. Well, you know, Hillary Clinton's excuse was she came from New York. So she bent to the banks because she comes from New York. He bent to the gun because he comes from Vermont. What we need are politicians who don't bend, who politicians who say, here's what the right answer is. How do you do that? And how do, well. You have an idea in your book. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the first step, there's an amazing bill that will be introduced this week. Uh, uh, 25th of April um, by a guy named Ro Kahana, who's a congressman from California. Uh, And Ro's introducing a bill that basically says every voter will get a voucher. And with the voucher, I I can't remember what the final number is, I think it's 50 bucks. (coughs) With that voucher, they can fund campaigns. So it's basically, we're going to rebate the first $50 of your taxes, and we're going to take that, you can take that, and then you use it to fund campaigns. You can't use it for anything else. You can only use it to fund campaigns. Everybody pays at least. So you can give it to the candidate of your choice. Yeah. And, and with that money, 
candidates can fund campaigns rather than spending. So now you'd have candidates who are actually talking about the issues that matter to the populace. Because they're getting their money from and, the and, 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 and yeah, and they're getting money from the public. So the candidate that can articulate the best solutions to these, uh, these problems, yeah. that can come up with the best ideas. Yeah, or excite the most people. I mean, you know. With I, an idea. This is not going to be a, you know, a philosophy seminar. Yeah. This is going to be politics. But yeah. the point is the politics is with real people, voters, as opposed to the funders of these campaigns. This, this, this voucher thing sounds really interesting. Yeah, and, 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 and this is supported by Republicans and Democrats alike. There's a guy named Richard Painter who is the favorite Republican for MSNBC. You see him on MSNBC talking all the time about Donald Trump and how much he hates Donald Trump. But he has a book where he has the same idea of $200 voucher that we get to fund not just Congress, but also presidential campaigns. Mm -hmm. So this is an idea that both Republicans and Democrats can Well, like. your book has been, has been rated very, uh, uh, ra um, what's the word? Reviewed, um, very, reviewed very favorably by left, uh, right wing, like the Cato Institute and places like that, that you know, tend to. Right, because I bend over backwards to tell the story in a way that doesn't try to alienate either side, and yeah. in particular Republicans. Look, when I was a Republican when I was a kid, I, I grew up, but you know, when I was a kid, I, uh, I was the uh, youngest member of a delegation in the 1980 Republican convention. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I know what they think, and um, I respect people who have views different from mine. Um, my parents, my, you know, my whole family is conservative, so like, it's not like I don't love people uh, whose views are different from mine. But I think this is not a left-right issue, right. and so. we should be able to talk about it in a way that unites America. It's an American issue. It's an American it's issue. It's an American issue because this country was founded on the idea that we are a, 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 a government of the people, yeah. by the people, and for the people. Yeah, and that's, that's a very radical idea. And what, I've, all, what I appreciated in talking to you about this, with, both with Lawrence and then also with Mark Blythe, is, is that you brought it down to fair play. Yeah. And it's about fair play. Of course it is. And the point and is, that's, is that this is not a system of where the, where the, the, you know, the fox is guarding the hen house. And, you know, it is, I mean, there was an interesting thing that I heard and it was talking about, you know, that if you look at the Tea Party, they think the issue is government. If you look at Occupy Wall Street, they think that the issue is business. What they don't realize is that it's government and business colluding Together. with each other. Together. And yeah. so they both have half the piece. And you want to talk about, for example, idea sex, the Tea Party and the Occupy Wall Street, they're both right that the system is screwed, but they should be combining their two worldviews to realize that it is this collusion. Yeah. What is well, you did a graph with a knife, a fork, and a spoon. When we, were at, when we, were at, we were at lunch. It was so hilarious. Like that, but it, but it, but it, but it made sense. Can you explain that graph? Yeah. So if you look at the growth in the American economy from like 1935 um, after the Depression to about mid 1970s, 1976 or seven, you see that the income going to workers and the income going to capital or the businesses are going at basically the same rate. And then beginning in the mid-70s, they start splitting. So that the workers, so ordinary average Americans, have seen no growth, literally no growth in their wages for 50 years. While income going to capital or to you know, um, um, Wall Street um, continues to climb at an incredible rate as productivity continues to push up the total amount of, that this economy produces. And what that means, and, and the question is, well, why is that? Like, did all of a sudden Americans just stop working hard? Or um, did we just forget how to get better? And the answer is, it's a great book called The Captured Economy that, show, that shows that it's actual government decisions, decisions by our government that have produced this inequality. It's not like the government's just failing to address inequality by like welfare payments or something like that. No, this is the government is actually intervening in the economy changing regulations in a way that begins to produce this inequality. And the most important area that happens is in finance and in the banks and in Wall Street, where they change regulations and they support and subsidize in a way that produces this inequality. And the question is, well, why does government do that? And the answer is because the people paying for the campaigns demand it. And so they deliver what is demanded so they can get the money they need to run their campaigns. And we will not address. They're the ones running the government. They run the government. And, and not in a deep. But can you explain how Citizens United, that Supreme Court decision, matters and doesn't matter so much? Yeah, so what Citizens United said was that corporations and unions, like rich people, have a constitutional right to spend unlimited amount of money in campaigns as long as they are independent of the campaign. 
So you can't coordinate with the campaign, but you're allowed to spend your own money in a campaign. To create a PAC, yeah. a political action committee, a super PAC. Yeah, just, right. But, but the thing that and they would run, they would run their own ads right. and things like that. The thing that corporations quickly discovered is that there was a high cost to free speech. So Target supported uh, an anti-gay candidate for governor in Minnesota and immediately found themselves being picketed all across the country because people are angry Target was spending that kind of money. So corporations quickly decided we don't want to be spending this kind of money. But the second decision after Citizens United, not even by the Supreme Court, it's a case called Speech Now, said that if you can spend unlimited amounts of money, then the First Amendment means you should be allowed to give unlimited amounts of money to independent political action committees. That's the super PAC. And those super PACs make so it So say that again, say that part again. So in addition to being allowed to spend unlimited amounts of money, that's Citizens United. Yeah. The First Amendment means you should be allowed to give unlimited amounts of money to an independent political action committee. Uh, when you say you should, just an individual should be able to? Corporation, union. The thing people, about corporations anybody. is you have so many different people represented in a corporation, Democrats, Republicans, Listen, independents. How are they able, the able to make a says. choice? Whatever, whatever management, management says. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, this is a big issue. Like, that's why? a huge issue. Right. Yeah, but that's completely that. covered over. And, you know, it's not just Americans. Like, corporations are international. So, so when you yeah. say corporations giving money, is it really American money? But, you know, no. the answer is no. But the point is, if you can create these independent political action committees, super PACs, those entities can launder the money, essentially. So if you're Target and you find a way through a C4 to give it to a super PAC, nobody's going to know it's really Target's money. And then you can really use that money to influence the political system. And that's been the real growth, super PACs. And super PACs um, have created this dependence, not just for... I'm surprised journalists haven't done a forensic trail of that, though. I mean, you could easily... Are you, you, sure you could they haven't? They've tried. We just... They've tried, but no, it's probably there's... done pretty, pretty uh, surreptitiously. Yeah, no, there's some really great journalistic work that has, you know, shown where this dark money goes. Um, so, you know, but the point is, who's surprised by that? Nobody. I mean, you know, we, we were talking about this, like, the, every American who, who could read your book or listen to you speak about this would be nodding their heads going, yeah, I know. Yeah. They don't know, but they know. Of course Nothing they know. is surprising, no. No. you know, and that's where the solution, but, well, but again, if you can provide people with a solution, like this voucher idea, something that makes sense, where you go, that's an idea that both sides can get behind, and that's how you get you know, the big money out of politics, or at least the corrupt money. Now, to a large extent, you know, the republic has never been any different, right? I mean, if, to a large extent, um, the republic has always been run, the government's always been run by the big money, hasn't it? Well, White landowners or whatever. Well, right. right. I mean, you want to talk about slavery periods? Sure. But just even after that. And there's no perfectly golden period. But the reality is, between the Second World War and maybe the beginning of the Reagan administration, um, or maybe 10 years before that, our government could actually do things. You know, we had a growing middle class economy. We had a government that was addressing problems. Like EPA gets established during the Nixon administration, right? Um, and it addresses real problems in a way that's not perfect. You can always whine and complain that it's not doing it well or it's not efficient. And all these legitimate criticism of government I think we should, we should make. But it was actually functioning. And members of Congress were not petty te telemarketers. That was not their job. You know, they, they had to worry about a campaign for maybe six months out of every two years. But for a year and a half, they could actually govern. Mm. That's totally different today. There's no such thing as governing. They spend their time constantly raising money to campaign to make it possible just to get reelected. And, and, and it's all special interests. Uh, <clears throat> it's lobbying efforts. It's it's, huge it's chunk. when when you're a when you're a politician, you are told essentially who to call, what to say. Essentially, if you yeah. want to stay, they're they're pretty obvious about it. If you want to stay in power, the, this is the dance. Yeah. You know, if we took that soundbite that you just said, Brian, and we took it out of context, and I told you that we were talking about Russia, I think you would believe we were talking about Russia. Yeah. Like, yes, like, there is Putin. He tells you what to do. There are decisions that are made. And then there are, there are elections in Russia. Don't you, do you use the example of Carlos Slim in the book? No, no, that's in Why Nations Fail. Yeah. So, you know, the point is, is that Carlos Slim, yes, he's a businessman, 
But he's not operating in the free market. He's operating in the economy of influence. Of Mexico. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and when he tried to wa- uh, operate in the yeah. real economy, it didn't it work out work, for him. Yeah. 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 yeah, and that's 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 a that's what you really want to avoid, because then you got you're rewarding people with real hustle, right. social hustle, right. people who can tell people what they want to hear. And right. They, and but this is the thing that drives me nuts. You know, America. We could talk about this depressing part of America for yeah. hours, but then you turn around and you look at the amazing part of America. Well, the economy's doing economy's amazing. Doing great, and we have full amazing employment, interv- uh, innovation. Yeah. I mean, you know, equality of consumption is yeah. is, is one of the rare Harvard professors who loves Hollywood. I love the stuff that Hollywood <laughs> produces. I, I think like America has incredible innovation and creativity. Yes, it does. And and yet we are burdened by this fact that this one institution that we are told as children we should be so respectful and proud of our tradition as a free society and a government. This institution is pathetic and an embarrassment around the world. So the world looks at America and they look at Silicon Valley, they look at the heartland of uh, America where we grow food, they look at Hollywood, they think this is an amazing place. And then they look at Washington and they can't stop giggling. They yeah. can't imagine. The traffic getting in there, 35,000 lobbyists that descend upon yeah. Washington daily, the traffic from Potomac to, it's a 14 mile uh, drive or something and you, it'll take you an hour and a half. My, my dad lived in, in, in Potomac. But also, I mean, why not, I mean, to Larry's point, like, if we can innovate everywhere else, why can't we innovate in yeah, Washington? Exactly. Why can't we, I mean, even just... Like, of course we can. Course I, we I can. think, again, I'm, I'm optimistic. I, I think the technology, the, to, the technological revolution is going to make it inevitable. I think it's going to create, there's great promise, at least, is great promise in the idea that things are becoming more democratic in some ways. Yes, Yes, there is a crazy concentration of wealth because of the way technology is dispersing itself. You know, you've got nine tech billionaires who have more money than 1.8 billion people of the poorest people. We've never seen that kind of disparity. But at the same time, there you have to give credit to the idea that most Americans have at least the things they didn't have. The certain conditions are unbearable. Your children starving. Uh, um, disease, diphtheria sweeping through. These things have, we, we are getting to a point where almost everybody has a cell phone. Almost everybody has access to Google. Almost everybody has access to entertainment. Everybody has access to protein and carbohydrates, the fats that keep your biology at least at a, at a, at a, at a certain temperature. And that's, that's not unbearable. Um, these are very important things that create, yes, complacency, but again, I, I find myself wondering if we are outgrowing government as we have known it, as we have always, done, even the nation state. You're, you're completely right. The technology is going to produce extraordinary abundance. And there's a minimum amount that Americans will always have. But what I fear is the future could be one of two very different futures. That abundance could be increasingly concentrated the way we see it concentrated now. The statistics you just gave about the nine billionaires, uh, yep. nine tech billionaires is like just one way of seeing it. And that concentration will produce these worlds which you know, they basically take care of themselves. They provide all of the public services privately, right? Whether it's security or education or food or technology, it's all private. And the rest of America lives this pathetic, miserable life. Because you're right, we all have cell phones. But when you don't have health care and you get sick, and then you are bankrupt the rest of your life because you don't have health care because you can't afford it, a that's a major problem. So, in, so one path is this abundance with very few people benefiting. Another path, which many people in Silicon Valley are arguing strongly for, is where the abundance is actually something that builds an America that makes it possible for us to actually all flourish. We all want that. I mean, I don't think anybody wants to live in a country where people can't afford dental care. Yeah. The dignity of just having teeth that are you can look at. That's a great example. I mean, dental care. It's I mean, fucking huge. When you get a toothache, yeah. It's a tiny fraction of America that can afford yeah. dental care. You right? break a tooth, you're on your own yeah, man. That's exactly right. But this is the point. We can't get that America unless we have a government that works, right? Now, I'm as cynical and skeptical about this government as anybody. You know, when Ronald Reagan said in 1981, government's not the solution, government is the problem. He said that back then because he was a libertarian. I think most people say it now because they think the government's just pathetic. It can't do anything. And I understand that. But I think, to take Hunter's point, we can innovate and make a government that can actually begin to do things Mm -hmm. more efficiently, more effectively, and actually give us what we need 
to make it so we don't have a future where people have to worry about whether their kids have health care or can afford dental care or, you know, can actually have a job or at least be able to live in a way that makes it feel like they're not constantly terrified about what's going to come around the corner. And that's the American spirit because that's what the founding fathers did. They innovated a type of government that would provide a better future for their children that the world hadn't seen. And they mm -hmm. had to draw on everything that was available. And they had Locke and Montesquieu and all these other thinkers. And we just have, you know, Lessig. Yeah, and and Callan. Let's say Callan. Also say Callan. Say, say Please say Callan. Please agree with me He's that Callan really not as well. Callan. Yeah, I haven't written a book. Callan. I haven't, Callan. I haven't, Callan. I haven't written a book because I haven't I haven't had time to write a book. Because yeah. you're doing too much. But my comedy, when I talk about my dick on stage, <laughs> there there's value. I don't care what you say, Lawrence. Or is it Larry? Or is it Professor? I don't even know what to say anymore. Well, I'm really excited uh, for the changes you'll make to the Washington Monument. Yes. Honor your dick. I want to keep this. I want to keep this podcast short because I want to. I want to send it to people who have short attention spans who matter, and uh, and and uh, there there are people out there because nobody has a lot of time. But I think that no, I think what you've done is is you know because you even said it. Somebody said uh, you. I, I I said Lawrence, tell him what you say. Uh, he wrote a book called Republic Lost, and you kind of explained it, and you looked at the guy, and you go, I know, do I really need a book to write that and say that <laughs> stuff? But, you know, the book is, is great because you give so many different examples and stuff. But, um, but that, that, I think you've explained what the problem is. And as far as I can tell, the first step to the solution is vouchers. Yeah, but Your government doesn't represent yeah. you. But the and thing we've got to do to get vouchers or any of these changes is to get politicians who will take on the problem. You know, and this is the most outrageous bit of it. You had this last presidential election, Donald Trump, drain the swamp. Okay, it's a great slogan. I'd love to take that slogan because I actually have ideas about how we can drain the swamp. But, you know, he didn't have a plan at all yeah. about draining. Bernie Sanders talked about money and politics all the time. But for the purpose of beating up Hillary Clinton, yeah. like, did he tell you what he was going to do no. to solve this problem? Nothing. Not no. a There's no solution. There's no, There's no concrete. So they've got to stop behaving like politicians pretending, this fantasy world of politics, pretending. It's, a, it's the difference elected. between a talking point and a solution. Exactly. And we have got to demand it. The only way they're going to do it is if every time a politician starts talking, you say, hey, wait, 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 wait. How are you going to fix this broken government first? Because, you know, I like your ideas about health care or whatever, but it's not possible until you fix this thing first. So network neutrality, Copyright policy, healthcare policy, equality, having a system where a government, uh, having a system where we have jobs that actually grow. These are the things a government's got to do, but none of these things will happen until we actually fix this corrupted and broken government first. So politicians have got to take it on, and they don't take it on now, and this is what they have to be embarrassed about. And we are, this is our job to embarrass them because they refuse to take on the most important problem. And they can't be embarrassed until everybody knows what they've been up to. Being embarrassed is about being caught. What I like about your impatience, Larry, and, and the way you phrase these things is that Hunter and I talk about, there's a lot of smart talk, <clears throat> and it's important, but it, it, what does it look like in the real world, man? What does it look like in the real world? And that's where the work goes in. You can isolate and, and, and talk about the problem, but solutions are what we really need. And, and I think you're doing that. I think that you're one of the rare thinkers that is, that is doing that. I think that you're very good at articulating and so I'd like describing and, and what the real problem is. But then there are solutions and there are people out there trying to do it, but a lot of them don't have the guts. And I do. I find the same thing. That's why all of us stop listening when politics. We instinctively know right away. It's music. You can hear the music in their voices. And you're like, here it goes. Yeah. Here, what, do you think I need to really watch the debates yeah. while you guys tell us what we need in general terms? No. No. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run. And you're like Cyrano de Bergerac because of my jawline. You're going to, you're going to speak in my ear. All right? With a, we have to get a small an earpiece that nobody can see. I need the glory, dude. You saw my charisma on stage. You're not going to compete with that shit. I'm sorry. Plus, I have more soda in my voice. You're too kind. You need a scumbag like me. A guy who can shape shift. All right. I'm there. You're the best. Lawrence Lessig, Hunter Motts, thank you for this amazing episode of the Brian Callen Rules All podcast. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> oh, I'm calling it something really amazing like that. Brian, it's called Brian Callen is the Solution Podcast. Brian, you need to start awarding yourself more medals. I'm, I need, I want to, like one of those Russian generals yes, yeah, exactly. with just a whole breastplate. Hero of the United States of America. I'm going to start wearing a breastplate. <laughs> I have a great body under this sweater. And that's the most, that's the other important thing to keep in mind. Is, you can Google young Brian Callen. I look the same. I have tight skin. All right, America. Uh, keep it real. <laughs> Shitty slogan. <laughs> keep it real, mofos. This has been Lawrence Lessig from Harvard Law School. That small, the, the Kremlin on the Charles, as, as Nixon said. Communist, thank you for listening. It was awesome. What a fucking great afternoon. Patreon, you guys have actually been giving money. That's something you set up. No idea. Never looked at the page. But I understand we're making enough money to break even. So I'm not losing money anymore. That's kind of good. After 300 episodes, I'm actually not losing money. We're actually breaking even. So give even more. Uh, it doesn't matter. Every little bit helps. $1,000, $6,000, even $10,000. And if you don't, well, you're, you're cheap. <laughs> By the way, we want to get rich, so give us money. Um, and thanks. make you more content. Yes, well, we're, we'll do it anyway. Yeah, but, we but, really but will. We'll do so. it anyway, even if you don't give money. But give money, man, because we want to pay our engineers like Reed Nicewonder and other people who are dedicating their time. I feel, I'm, I'm amazed that so many people are willing to work for free, but I want to pay them. I'm not going to take any of the money. What am I going to do, buy another Tesla? <laughs> anyway. <laughs>